Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a gentleman here who would like to make a brief announcement concerning a program at a different museum. And so we'll go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this kind of ties in with his uh, presentation tonight. And uh, in fact, he's done work with this group uh, previously. Um, this is through the H. Lee White Museum in Oswego. I was there Wednesday and happened to see their information on this program, which is called Eclipses of Navigation. And that's going to be held April 24th. It's Wednesday uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. If anybody's interested in that. And I've got some small handout cards if uh, anybody was interested. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, as it says, my name is John Russo, and just uh, by way of introduction, I'll mention that I've been an amateur astronomer my whole life, pretty much, and I own uh, too many telescopes, right? Uh, and I taught college level astronomy uh, part time for oh, two different colleges over the last little bit for about 22 years. So I've got a fairly good background in astronomy. Now, uh, I've never owned a boat bigger than 22 feet, and I have never personally done celestial navigation. Okay, let's get that out of the way right <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, but I was asked to do this presentation, so uh, here we are. I'm going to start off. Uh, oh, yeah, I was going to tell you, I, my computer quit this past week, and I just got a new one three hours ago. <laughs> they, they couldn't make it work right at the Geek Squad. We couldn't make it work right here. Fortunately, I had the foresight to put the program on a flash drive, but Caitlin got the, the museum's computer working, I think. So, okay. Uh, this picture appears to show, I pulled this off the web, a boat sailing with no wind into a weird looking storm, <laughs> but never mind. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm going to start off with some terms and I'll explain some of this. I think most of you can probably read this. If you can, I'll go over it lately. But uh, I got to tell you about some of my students, you know, they get bored and start texting under the table. There's little muscles that move up in here, and you can tell them something. <laughs> but uh, uh, the celestial sphere, I think we all know what that is. It's a non existent but apparent sphere surrounding the Earth. The zenith point directly overhead. I'm assuming probably a lot of you know these terms, but uh, I'll, I'll go through them. North Celestial Pole is the point on the celestial, the non existent celestial sphere directly over the Earth's North Pole. And as most of you probably know, the star Polaris is close to it, within about one degree. It's not directly on it. That has not always been true but, uh, because of the Earth's what's called precession of its axis. But for our purposes, it's, we can call it the North Pole. If anybody can read these sections within one, one degree, my hat's off to them so up. Uh, uh, one degree is enough. Okay, the local meridian is an imaginary line on the celestial sphere, just as it says, starts due north, it goes through the north celestial pole and the zenith to the south plane. Uh, in other words, wherever you are on Earth, you have your own personal meridian, whether you want it or not. <laughs> it's there. Okay, uh, azimuth is simply direction around the horizon. Most of you probably know this. North is zero. You go to the right clockwise uh, through 90, 180, 270 back to the north, which is zero and 360. Altitude is not altitude of an air, air, aircraft flying. It's angular height above the horizon, zero to 90 degrees. The zenith is straight up 90 degrees. It, the altitude can't exceed 90. If it does, it was easier to come up the other side. So. Uh, zenith distance, this is a little more complicated. It's the angular distance of an object from the zenith. In other words, you start with the zenith and go down to our object. We'll come back, back to that. Uh, GP, geographical point. The location of a point on Earth directly under an astronomical body, usually the sun. That just means that if you're standing on this point on Earth, whatever the body is, is directly over your head. It's in your local zenith. This is a little, a little bit harder to understand. Great circle, any circle on the Earth's surface, uh, the size of the Earth. 
spherical trig triangles on spheres, just like I said. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time GMT, that's the world standard for navigational time or all kinds of stuff. Uh, Nautical Almanac, I said a large book. This one isn't all that book. This one isn't that big, but it really is full of tables. The whole book looks like this. I was just leaving for it. So, but if you're going to do celestial navigation, you will need one. Uh, in today's world, celestial navigation is becoming a lot start because of GPS. Uh, for the last, what, 20, 30 years at least, more and more and more shipping uh, aircraft rely on a GPS. However, sooner or later, your GPS thing will fail. Anything electronic fails. I've had two computer failures today. Uh, so even even today on large ships, there's somebody on board has a backup knowledge of social navigation, believe it or not. It's not used very much, it's basically obsolete, but when all else fails, uh, you can try it. If you have any questions at any time, just uh, speak up. So okay, if we're okay here, we'll continue on. Uh, I'm gonna do a few slides here on history. Uh, starting with some things that may not have too much directly to do with navigation. Uh, the Egyptians have to be mentioned because they invented a 24 hour day. That's where the 24 hours came from. Uh, they did it kind of strange though. Our, our hours are all the same length, but they had 12 hours of dark and 12 hours of light. So in the summertime, the daytime hours got stretched and the nighttime hours got compressed. Of course, they didn't have accurate clocks. They had, you know, uh, some they call them sand, sand clocks. Uh, at their lower latitude than us, though, we're about 44 degrees here. Most of Egypt is more like 25. Uh, the seasonal change in the length of the day and night didn't wasn't as great as it is here. So apparently, it wasn't too much of a problem for them. They also built these large pillars, obelisks. You probably recognize this one, uh, St. Peter's Square. And some of them were actually used as sundials, we think. Uh, so that's what the Egyptians tend to be remembered for. Okay, Polynesians. Uh, these were pretty amazing people. I, I've learned in recent years, because I do projects like this once in a while, I've learned a lot more history than. How would I put it? Maybe I should have paid more attention to some of the history classes. Uh, but I've learned more about some of these cultures and things. And uh, this is this is a typical Polynesian boat of the period, we think. And that looks like a pretty good design to me. I mean, that thing looks like it would move. Uh, it's a catamaran. It's got nice slim hulls. Uh, as luck would have it, a guy that I know, he's the part-time minister of our church, was born in Hawaii. And he helped build a replica about, I don't know, 20 years ago. He didn't get to sail on it. He did help build it. And it sailed, I don't know, at least Hawaii, uh, California, Alaska. I don't know if it went to Polynesia or not. So he, he gave me a little bit of insight into that. But we're not really here to talk about boat construction, but that looks like a pretty good design to me. Anyhow, uh, they were down there in the southeastern uh, uh, Pacific. And they went over a good part of the ocean. As far as Hawaii, uh, as far as the, they used things that they could see on Earth quite a bit, wave patterns, birds, clouds, like it says. Uh, however, they did use the sun's rising and setting points. Um, and they used them as latitude references. Uh, am I blocking anybody's view here? I'll try to back up a little bit. If I, I, I try to see what I'm doing by, by myself. If you want to move or yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about, about that. Uh, they never, most of the territory that they sailed wasn't that far from the equator. And at the Earth's equator, the celestial equator passes directly overhead because it's directly over the Earth's equator. Okay. Uh, the, whole, the whole celestial sphere, more or less, is visible. Of course, from here it's not. Uh, any star near the zenith is near the celestial equator. All stars, not just those near the equator, but all stars around the horizon rise and set vertically. If you're on the Earth's equator and you look north, you'll see the stars do little, little loops like this. They rise vertically and set vertically. 
all over the sky if you're at the Earth's the equator. So that helped them with their rising and setting points. But I think primarily from what I read, they, they went by islands. They went from island to island. They trained, they were very highly trained. The older, more experienced sailors and navigators would bring young people up to learn the craft. They learned wave patterns. They learned where islands were. They knew that an island, at least in out in the Pacific Ocean, would tend to have a cloud over it. And even if the horizon, if the island was over the horizon, they could see the cloud. And they knew from experience what island it was. And they either would head toward it or use it as a waypoint if they didn't want. Uh, so their use of celestial navigation was somewhat limited, but they did they did do it to some, some extent. And that, what they did with the stars, is the basis of our coordinate systems today. Latitude and longitude on Earth. And long, right, uh, latitude and longitude in the sky are called right ascension and declination. Uh, I think I reversed that, but never mind. Declination is north south, right ascension is east, east west. And for some reason, if you're looking in the southern sky, right ascension always increases to the left. I didn't invent the terms. Okay, there is no left ascension. <laughs> is there any questions on this stuff? Okay. Ancient Greeks, these people were pretty amazing. Uh, you, if, if, all, if you can all read that, I don't know. Can everybody read that right there as writing? Okay, I don't have to go all, all through them. I'll just uh, mention the ones that I think are especially important. Uh, uh, Pythagoras for the spherical Earth. Um, some of the Greeks thought it was, some thought it wasn't. They, these people, I always thought of these as, as like the Greeks as these wise men sitting around the table talking stuff out. But actually, as you can see, they're, they span hundreds of years. Very few were actually contemporaries. And they didn't all agree. Some thought the Earth was round, some thought it was flat. Okay, the Earth centered uh, universe was Aristotle, and that, that concept survived for a long, long time, about 1800 years. Because it's pretty natural to assume, hey, you can't feel any motion in the Earth, and, and uh, everything seems to swing around from there in the sky. So, the Earth is stationary. It's common sense. It turns out it wasn't true, but it's it's common sense. Earth revolving around the sun. Uh, that was not universally agreed to either. Uh, Eratosthenes with the Earth's diameter. I'm, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on him. It doesn't directly bear on celestial navigation, but he did an incredibly amazing thing in 240 BC. He estimated the size of the Earth. The diameter and circumference of the Earth. He did it by measuring shadows. Uh, he knew that in a place called Syene in, in, in Egypt, a, on the first day of summer at noon, the sun shone straight down a vertical well with no shadows. He also knew that in Alexandria, uh, there was a seven degree, if you put a vertical stick and measured the shadow and calculated the triangle, there was a seven degree shadow. So he concluded that uh, it was that fraction of the Earth's circumference. Then all he had to do was measure the, the north-south distance between those two places. And they aren't due south and north of each other. So he had to allow for that. And the method of measuring distance in those days was the days travel on Camelback. That was the unit of, of measure. So he actually came within 10%. Some people feel he came within 5 5%. And this is at a time when Half the people that knew anything at all didn't think the Earth was even wrong. To me, that's an just it was an incredible achievement. Scholars are a little bit divided. Some say he really wasn't good, others say he got, got lucky, but in any case, he did come up with an accurate number. Okay. And the geocentric model, Earth-centered universe, pretty much was solidified by Ptolemy, but it was the same basic concept that came from Aristotle. Okay, any question on Greeks? Questions? Okay. Okay, the Vikings. I can't believe the Vikings all. Uh, as I said, they were excellent and fearless sailors, navigators, and warriors. Uh, you didn't want to get in their way. Okay, let's kind of leave it at that. They were great sailors and navigators. They weren't probably the nicest guys. So, best you say out of the way. Uh, 
as it says, they went up and down the European coast, even into the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and they reached North America and what is now Canada. Uh, pretty good evidence of it that 500 years be, before Columbus. And they did that really by sailing the latitude. They sailed down the coast until the North Star was at the right altitude. And then they just sailed uh, east. And they knew they would get to Iceland and Greenland. And if they kept going, they would get to North America. They didn't know it was North America, but they, they knew there was land there. Uh, that's something I should maybe uh, put a little more stress on. Since Polaris is very near the North Celestial Pole, we can take it as the North Celestial Pole. Uh, the altitude of Polaris, the angle from the horizon up to Polaris, equals your, your latitude. Mm -hmm. We're at 44 north, and if you measure it accurately, which some of us have done, uh, you'll find that it's 44 degrees high. Okay? Myself and another guy present here, uh, Chris, I was working, we're working on a project uh, with the total eclipse coming on Monday to actually get uh, scientifically significant data. But one of the requirements is that we learn how to pull it on a telescope. And so we actually used Polaris. We went out there one night and used, used Polaris to verify that our alignment of the telescope was, was correct. <coughs> okay, so that's pretty simple. L3 Polaris equals your latitude. Uh, the rising and setting points, the sun were used, and they had something called a sunstone, which nobody seems to know exactly what it was. None seems to have survived, but it was some sort of a crystal, maybe calcite, that they could hold it, and even on an overcast day, they could get the general direction of the sun from it. But to this day, nobody knows what it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's lost. But apparently it worked because they got around pretty good for over a thousand years ago. Okay, questions? All right. All right. This is a little bit of more or less straight history. You, uh, you can read it. I'll just highlight a little bit. The compass became workable around 1200 AD. Uh, the big problem with measuring longitude is if you we were going very far. Because latitude, knowing what stars indicate the latitude, doesn't help you build longitude. Because at the same longitude, you can be anywhere on Earth, and the same stars will pass through the same apparent places. So there was no good way to get it. And you had the only way to get it was an accurate uh, time reference, in other words, a good clock. And as I said, a lot of explorers got lost, some who got lost forever. Uh, the people who read about the history books probably were either lucky or very, very good. Uh, I suspect an awful lot more ships went out than came, came back. But the history books don't, don't tell us that. You've all heard Galileo. He suggested, being a real scientist, uh, he suggested the timing of the motions of Jupiter's moons, which he discovered with his telescope, first telescope, could be used to calculate longitude, which is, in theory, true. But uh, it takes a, a decent telescope to get any accurate measurements of these things. What he meant was, they, as they revolve around Jupiter, they, they can occult each other, they also pass in front of and behind the planet. And if you could time those appearances and disappearances accurately, looking into tables that have been prepared by astronomers, you could tell theoretically what time it was. It's a very involved procedure. Uh, first place, you gotta have a decent telescope. Binoculars will show those moves, but if you want accurate measurements, you need a real telescope. And you have to somehow steadily support it by pitching and rolling ship. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how you do that, and they certainly didn't know how to, how to do it. They didn't have jars the same way as that. So it took a lot of a lot of effort, good eyesight, and very involved math. It didn't get, get popular. Okay. <clears throat> Longitude Act was passed in England, 1714. 20,000 pounds prize for anybody that could build an accurate shipboard clock. Uh, I'm not sure what the English pound was worth then, but 20,000 of them must have been quite a bit. Okay. Uh, and it took a long time for anything to really happen. The lunar distance uh, method was popular or at least promoted between the years I told you there. And uh, it's based on the angular distance between the sun and the moon. And for that, you need an accurate way to measure angles. 
And then you had to do an awful lot of math and look at tables to try to figure out what time it is. The moon, I might mention, it sounds pretty simple. The moon revolves around the Earth. Uh, Earth revolves around the sun. But the moon's motion, when you really get into it, is extremely complicated. The orbit is not round, it's an ellipse. The speed of the moon in its orbit varies. Uh, its distance from Earth varies a little bit. It's not, it's, it's, even though it looks big and easy, it's using it to navigate it or to determine time is not that easy, as they found out. The quadrant, 1731, was the ancestor of the sector, okay? Uh, and it was used to navigate from England to St. Hel St. Helena uh, to observe a transit of Venus. And I like to throw this in, it has nothing to do with, with navigation, but Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon observed that transit. A few years later, they drew their line in the United States, what is now the United States, the Mason Dixon line. I was not aware of that until I did the research for this uh, talk. Okay, any questions? All right. This is the guy that solved the problem, uh, John Harrison. Uh, he was, as it says here, he was an ordinary guy in England. Uh, um, he did have some fantastic talent for designing and building clocks. He didn't have extensive formal education, but he just had the knack, the knack for being able to do it, kind of out of nowhere. Uh, he was also methodical and very persistent, as we will see. Uh, his first clock, with no particular training, he, he built in uh, 1713. He built a pendulum clock when, when he was 20 years old, and it actually worked. I can't imagine anybody sitting down and designing a pendulum clock and having to work on the first track. I'm a fairly handy guy with things, but I, I just can't visualize that. But he was very special. Okay. Uh, he built a better clock, never mind what the equation of time is. It's the difference between basically um, what we call local mean time and uh, zone time. But anyway, he understood it. And he actually put a paper in the back of a clock that explained it. Okay. Um, he built a tower clock. As of the time of the research that I or the book that I read, it had been running for, for 270 years. It had to be wound every day. It wasn't electric or anything like, like that. But uh, that's pretty good. Um, he used uh, wood parts. Some of the gears and whatnot were wood because uh, it's a self lubricating wood. What he was worried about was that any artificial lubricants, oil or anything like that, change viscosity and temperature. If it's hot, the clock would run fast. If it got cold, it would slow down because the book can thicken up. Okay. Uh, so he understood these various things. And uh, he, he began a seagoing clock to go for the longitude price. And he knew it would be have to be way better than anything he had ever done before. Uh, his worst problem turned out to be the longitude committee would be judging it because they were very biased in terms of in favor of another method. They didn't really want to part with the money, I think that's what it amounted to, but uh, who knows. Okay. As it says, he, he did the H1, which did, did okay in short-term trials, but he decided to go ahead and build the H2. You notice the years there. It was 11 years later that he built the H2. He was living on not exactly handouts, but a subsidy from the government, I think, to do this because he was married to have family. And all he seemed to do was design clocks. So he had to work on something. Uh, but that one was never officially tested because he still thought he could do it to a better. This is his own thinking. He wasn't even thinking about the price. Uh, so between what? Uh, 1730 and 1757, 27 years. Uh, he wasn't happy with his own own work, even though it was the best in the world at the time. He was apparently a very fussy guy. Okay, only three years later, really quick for him, he built the H4, which is a, looked like a, a, a large uh, wristwatch. It was five inches in diameter and only weighed three, three pounds. 
these monsters before, well, I'll show you a picture of them in a minute, weigh about uh, around 70, 65, 75 pounds. They had jeweled bearings, and what that means is he hollowed out, he made bearings out of diamonds and rubies and stuff like that because they were, they were, they were so hard that they would run without lubrication. Uh, and, and apparently before him, nobody, nobody had done this before. He was even ahead of the Swiss uh, watchmakers. Okay, but it was rejected by the, the committee which wanted to promote the lunar distance method. So uh, this is really condensed down, but he appealed to the king directly and got an e e equivalent award. And as it says, the H4 uh, worked really well. It was in mass production by 1785 and by 1805, everybody knew he had been the best. By that time he had passed away. <laughs> so he basically devoted most of his life uh, to making accurate clocks. Okay, the prime meridian, I just threw this in. This had nothing to do with him, but uh, the prime meridian was located for the last time in Grand Chamber in 1884, and that's where we figure our time from ever since. Okay, any questions there? So okay. he won the prize, John? John? I'm sorry, what? Did he, uh, he won the prize anyway? He never got the, the uh, longitude prize. Oh. The king gave him an equivalent prize because the king knew that the committee was hopelessly biased. And apparently, even the king couldn't kick him out. So he, the crown awarded him directly, and he, and he put the prize. So no, he never did get the actual longitude. I don't think anybody did, because what happened was the lunar distance method fell into disuse. Because once you knew what time it was, you, you could you could navigate by the means. So it just failed because nobody wanted to use it. This way it was simpler. Not simple, but simpler. Any other? Okay. Wow. That's his chronometers. Now he, he granted he spent a lot of years, 30 years. Jeez. But these are fantastic pieces of work. I've read a lot more about them than what I've got time to tell you about here. But there was nothing on earth like these at the time. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. He was just an amazing craftsman. But he, he understood the theory and he knew how to. He didn't just like make fine looking pieces, but he knew how to make them work and work accurately. Yeah. Are they in order from H1, 2, 3, and 4? Yes. Wow. They're not to scale. Yeah. Probably the first three are approximately. This was only six inches in diameter. Wow. And these things were probably like so. They weighed about 75 pounds. Wow. So I had heard of this guy before, but I didn't know that much about him. And reading, uh, reading up on this, I uh, learned a lot. It was just a, how this was some quirk of fate, like that he had the intelligence and the ability, the perseverance and the manual skills to do this. He was a perfectly ordinary guy. He had no advanced education. He wasn't really uh, just a common guy. And then awesome. Any other? They, is there uh, models or any existence of these still around? They're still in existence. In, they're in uh, they're in England. They're in a museum. You can't touch them. They're they're like in the case to see They're encased in you know, I don't know, plexiglass four inches thick or something. But so, but they still all four of these still exist. Yeah. And incidentally, he considered uh, uh, how long is that? Ten second error in six months is large. That's how good his clocks were. Uh, we aren't talking time next year. <laughs> okay. But the first ones were kind of big and cumbersome, and on, uh, on ship, they, they were, well, they got in the way. The average sailor, if he banged into them, or, you know, was, didn't fully understand and was likely to damage them. Uh, but they were designed to withstand the motions of a ship, pitching and, and rolling, salt air, extreme temperature differences. They, they covered it all. Truly amazing to me. Okay. Well, that's all background. Now I got to actually start doing a little mitigation here. <laughs> okay. But I figured without the background, none of this would probably mean anything. Okay. Uh, these are obvious things. If you're close to shore, you look at landmarks, you pretty much know where, where you are. Okay. Uh, by knowing where you are, you can either by eye, 
which is the way I've always done it because I never, <laughs> I never really went very far. Uh, you can, or chart, you can set a course towards your destination or whatever and just keep repeating the procedure until you got there. Uh, however, when you're out in the open ocean with no reference points, celestial navigation does give you reference points. Uh, fixed points of reference on the Earth. Uh, one such point is the geographical position of the celestial body. That's a very fundamental thing. That diagram there, I'm not going to spend too much time on it right now because uh, uh, I'm going to develop another one. But uh, this is the GP of the sun. The sun would have been directly over that point on Earth at, that, at the time this diagram was drawn. Okay. This is pretty fundamental stuff here. It took me a couple of tries to understand this because I kept reading that the zenith distance was equal to the distance from you to the geographical position of the body. And I thought, how is that possible? How can arc up in the sky be equal to any distance on Earth? You know, that's, that's nuts. Well, it's equal in degrees. That's, I drew this diagram myself. In fact, I drew quite a few diagrams, but this didn't come out of the book. Uh, I showed the Earth here in cross section, looking kind of looking at it from the side. You are here, and the uh, geographical position of the Sun is here. Okay, and the zenith distance, I happen to draw it as I guess 60. I drew this as 30 degree altitude. That means the zenith distance is 60 degrees. And since this, these lines are straight, I proved to myself and hopefully to you that this arc in degrees actually is. The same as this arc in degrees. That if that's a little cloudy, don't worry about it. It took me three or four tries. Okay, uh, they're not. You can't use miles or kilometers or anything like that because that's an arc in the sky. It's it's nothing but degrees. But this should clarify the point that this arc is equal to this arc in degrees. Can't say distance in the sky because the celestial sphere doesn't even really exist. Okay, so that's, I hope that diagram clarifies things here a little bit. Uh, any questions on this? Okay, uh, notice I use capital letters here. Uh, one degree equals 60 nautical miles. Uh, degrees can be broken down into minutes, therefore one minute of arc equals one nautical mile on the surface of the Earth. That's why nautical miles are different than uh, statute miles. It works out better for navigators. Okay, so this is kind of an important statement here. It'll be on the test. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I took. I have to admit, this, I'm developing a navigational triangle here, and I John, found you gotta. I'm, I'm struggling with the one degree equals sixty nautical miles. Okay, uh, a nautical mile was, I think, designed to equal one minute of arc on the surface of the Earth. Like one degree equals 60 nautical miles. If you work your way around the Earth, you've got 360 degrees. Okay, so the circumference of the Earth would be in nautical miles would be 360 uh, times 60. I think I said that right. Uh, that, that they divided the circumference of the Earth up in a, in a unit that came out fairly even. So let's back up there a little bit if I can. Yeah, one degree of arc on the Earth, like one degree of longitude or latitude, it doesn't matter. One degree is 60 nautical miles. And you got 360 degrees. So the entire circumference of the Earth would be 60 times 360 yeah, in nautical miles. Okay, that help? So on that diagram, the 30 degrees would be what, 1800 or 18,000? Well, if you look closely, I didn't put any, any degrees on this. This angle is 30 and this angle is 60, but I didn't say what the zenith distance was. But yes, you're right. One degree of that arc, whatever it is, would equal 60 nautical miles. This might be a little bit clearer a few slides down the road. Okay. Some of this gets a little thick. I tell you, celestial navigation is extremely complex. 
what I'm presenting here tonight is like a skim overview. Uh, it would take a lot of study to become a proficient celestial navigator. But when you're navigating on the chart, yeah, that's exactly what you use minutes and seconds. Yes. To, to, yes, it is. to do all your yeah. plotting. I'm yeah. using whole degrees here because right. it's easier to understand. Easier than that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you have to break it down much finer than this. Any other? Okay. So I start, well, I'm starting out with an example, which I didn't copy straight from the book. I drew my own drawings, but it's very similar to what's in one of these books. Okay. And uh, you, you find yourself in the ocean on some boat with an estimated position of 37 degrees north and 67 degrees west, which tells you you're in the Atlantic Ocean if you know anything about the world. Okay. Uh, so that's the starting point. You are there. You don't know where you are, but you know that you're at that point. But these coordinates, you're assuming it's an assumed position. Okay. And I, again, this is not done the way it would be on a boat, but I'm developing it uh, so you can understand the principles better using a globe. Real navigators don't use globes. That reckoning is actually deduced reckoning. Uh, I have a humorous book on sailing, which mentions, among other things, that. Dead reckoning is a method of navigation used by many navigators, almost all, all of whom are dead. Uh, <laughs> but it is written tongue in cheek. <laughs> but it really shouldn't be read dead at all. It's really abbreviated. Nautical uh, charts are notorious for, for abbreviations. If any of you have ever used them, you already know that. Uh, anyway, so this is where you think you are. And I labeled it you. Okay. This is a section which as you probably know, has absolutely nothing to do with sex. Uh, so I never really looked at one closely until a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so what it is, is a tool mirror device used to accurately measure angles. The angular distance between objects, most often vertical. All right, I just happen to have a couple of them here. These are plastic jobs designed to be used by clusters like us, like me. So I won't break up anything really expensive. But uh, to show you how they work, uh, I don't have any sun in here or any stars, but I'm going to uh, assume the horizon is a light switch out there on the, on the far wall. And the top of the door is a, a celestial object. And if you don't mind, I'll lean on the wall a little bit. And uh, I'm set at zero. So I'm going to measure. This will go better without my glasses, but uh, in fact, I can't even find it wrong with my glasses on. Okay. Uh, all right, there's a switch. And I'm now going to bring the top of the door down. You got a split field of view here. It's got two mirrors. There's actually two optical systems side by side. And reading the scale on the bottom, the angle is uh, about eight, eight degrees. So the top of the doorway is eight degrees higher than that light, light switch, which uh, doesn't tell us much in here, but this is how navigators find the altitude of celestial objects. There's a vernier scale here on the bottom, so you can get right down into hundreds of a degree if you want. But I'm trying to picture somebody 200 years ago, 300 years ago, standing on some pitching board boat with wind blowing, wind blowing on I'm trying to trying to get the altitude or something. I don't think the vernier would ever be used. <laughs> but that's the principle. If you like, I've got a couple here. I can pass them around. You can play, you can't hurt these things much, I don't think. So I'll start one over here. And I'll start one over here. If you break one, I don't know. Okay, well, so we <laughs> you can cite on different things if, if you can. It's, there's a kind of, it takes a little bit of practice. But you can play with that while we uh, continue on. So basically, it's a fancy sighting device. Questions? Okay. So, this particular sailor used it to measure the altitude of the sun at exactly 5 p.m. his time, which you cannot use directly in navigation. But never mind that, that for now. I'm trying to keep this simple. And the sun was 31 degrees high. Subtracting from 90 degrees, you get the sun's zenith distance, which is 59. So, you can draw this little line on your imaginary globe. 
Uh, you consult your nautical almanac, which has positions of the sun every two minutes or something per hour. Uh, you plot the uh, geographical position of the sun is at latitude 24 north or 134 west. And that's what is shown here. You are here, the geographical position of the sun is here. I'm developing this very slowly step by step so you may have some idea of what's going on. Now you can draw meridians, those north south lines, through your assumed position and the GP of the sun. I think you all know what meridians are, but in case there's, there's these two things. Okay. Uh, so you can draw these on a globe. Uh, you see an odd looking triangle starting to take shape. It's a spherical triangle with curved sides. Okay. Uh, you can draw in this triangle with solid lines. You don't need the meridians anymore. Uh, so you can follow this red line. I probably don't have to read it to you. You can find out that one side of this triangle is 53 three degrees, that meridian that, that you're on. Okay. Uh, and by subtracting the uh, latitude of the sun's GP from 90, you get the second side of the triangle to be 66 degrees. Okay. Uh, by subtracting your longitude and the longitude of the sun's GP, you find that the angle up here is 67 degrees. But this is all based on geometry and so, so circles, right? I think you can see the principle what I'm doing. Yes. But you only know your longitude if you know the difference between your local time and the time in Greenwich, right? I'm not even getting into that right now. <laughs> that just complicates it further. You're, you're, you're right. But I don't even want to go there right now. Okay. So... We now know two sides of the triangle and the included angle, all by more or less simple math. So you should be able to find that third side, this actual distance. Digging into that spherical trig book, by the way, you wouldn't really have that book on the boat. There. This is all picked up in terms of uh, tables. Uh, the unknown side is 58 degrees. So if you wanted to know the distance, it would be 58 times, times 60 in nautical miles. This might be a good time to turn this globe around and show you. I plotted this very triangle on the globe rather cr crudely so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Your assumed position is here. Here's your uh, meridians. And this is the geographical position of the sun to scale. That's what it would actually look like on, on a real goal. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Okay. So now we're, we've come quite a ways. One little problem though. You measured 59 degrees with your sextant and you calculated uh, um, 58. So you're not at the point you thought you were at, assuming your sextant reading was accurate. 60 miles off. You're 60 miles away, farther away from the sun's geographical position. This is why I try to keep everything at even degrees. If we get into minutes and seconds, it's just going to get totally bogged down in numbers. Bad enough as it is. Okay. But you know it was approximately in the first place. It was an assumed dead reckoning position. But you are within one degree. That, that's the good news. 60 nautical miles. Well, not something out in the middle of the Atlantic. 60 nautical miles isn't that far off. So you notice your measured uh, ZD is greater. So you're farther. So therefore, you extend this line out and add 0. 0.0. Okay. Uh, your actual position must be somewhere in a circle with a radius of side C plus 60 miles. That's a little unclear. Put the center of your compass here, uh, put the pencil point of your compass here and draw an arc on the surface of the globe. It's kind of hard to represent this on a flat sheet of paper, but it's an actual arc drawn on the surface about this center point, okay? 
So as, so as the arc is so big, it, it ain't not too far distance from that point. You're talking basically talking about a straight line. So you can actually draw that arc or a straight line, mark off reasonable distances, which the author did not define. I would assume one, one degree. So you label this LOP, line of position, because you are somewhere on that line, which would be this line here. And the longitude of Greenwich, the zero meridian, would be right on the visible edge of the Earth here, right here. Now, what you got to do is plot this on a chart. Real navigators don't do fools at all. They don't go through all this crazy stuff. I did this to try to make it understandable. Okay. You need to know the angle of the lower right hand corner. Plot it on a chart without using the, the poles and all, all this other stuff. You call it Z because it should be the last thing you have to live. Going back into your spherical trig, you find that it's 83 degrees. And this agrees with your sighting because the sun was pretty well over to the west, not far from 90 degrees uh, when, when you started. Okay. Here we're plotted on the chart. We've gotten rid of the rule now. We're only using the part that we really need to use, which obviously is the, uh, the part right around here. Okay. Uh, it says the plotting procedure is simple. It's actually not totally simple, but uh, you locate the, the point U, your assumed position by the latitude and longitude that you assume. And then uh, you just plot what you need to plot. You've extended the lines from the sun's GP to, uh, to zero. You've drawn the new line perpendicular, but this is a new line perpendicular to line O U. This line is new. And it's not parallel with your, with your uh, meridian. It's a perpendicular to your line of sight. So this is your line of position. You're on that, that line. Here's where it gets a little spooky to me. Uh, by now, the sun's moved on, so you take a new sighting. And since you're not developing everything from nothing, you figure out your new sighting pretty fast and plot the new LOP on your chart, which is here. OK? Because angle Z has changed since the sun has moved, the Earth keeps right on turning. Your second LOP crosses the first. Here, uh, knowing your, your speed and course from the time between your sights, you move the first LOP accordingly. So your original LOP was here, uh, here, now it's here. To me, this is a little fuzzy. The course was never defined, nor is the speed, but it's the procedure. So the place where those two lines cross is your fix, which on this chart came out to be here. Now, I, there's no grid here that you can see what your coordinates are, but obviously on the actual nautical chart, you could, you could plot your, your position. Uh, any questions up to here? Okay. Well, somebody had to go, if you had a nautical chart, somebody had to go and create the chart. A lot of people spent a lot of time creating these tables. Right. Yeah, I showed you what's in here. Right. This took a lot of guys or girls, whoever, a lot of time. This is the only one either, because you needed a, a set of uh, trigonometry tables, among other things. Okay. Some additional comments here. As most of these are self explanatory, this has been simplified as much as I thought was reasonable or realistic, uh, you wouldn't need to go Spherical trig would not actually have to be done. You could look it up in tables. Uh, some of these steps would be done in a different order. I've said this several times already, but I tried to develop this in, in the way that it was most understandable. In nautical al almanac is absolutely essential. I suppose now you can get this stuff on, online. You wouldn't physically need the book, except if you lose your uh, your, your uh, GPS, you're probably going to lose uh, the ability to find stuff on, online too. Local time cannot be directly used. You have to convert everything to GMT. When I said the guy did a sighting at 5 p.m., his time, that may have been true, but you can't use that field directly. It's got to be converted to Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, a couple of words about these, a couple of correction steps. There's something called the dip correction. Uh, it's a vertical adjustment to your sighting 
that allows you to hide your eyes above the water. All this geometry and trigonometry is based on a tangent to the surface of the Earth. Even on a small boat, your eye is going to be six feet or more above the water. And believe it or not, that makes a difference. The only way you could use those tables with no corrections accurately would be to have your eye at the water line. And uh, not to be flipped, but if the water line is up to your eyeballs, you've got better things to worry about than that. Again. <laughs> okay? Uh, so it's a correction that you have to make uh, based on your height above the water, which on a small boat might be 10 feet, on a large ship it might be 30 or even 50. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, Johnny. Yeah, because each boat would have its own unique dip correction. Right. Based on the deck height and, and possibly the draft, and, and right. even the waves can change. On boats, I mean, on an ordinary boat that we, like you would see around here, a 10 foot elevation of your eye save wouldn't make a big difference. But boats going up and down the St. Lawrence River don't use the last leg again. If you're out in the middle of the ocean, you're probably on a pretty good sized ship, or at least a large boat, and your eye would be much higher. So you do have to factor this mm -hmm. in. Remember, one. One minute of arc is, is uh, one dollar a mile. So you do have to factor it in. Then there's the refraction correction. You may have never heard of that, but that has that is atmospheric refraction. Objects near the horizon look higher than they really are. The Earth's atmosphere actually bends light and makes things appear higher. When you see the sun just touching the horizon setting, Assuming it's dim enough, you can look directly at it. It's actually below the horizon. Uh, re refraction raises the sun more than half a degree. Uh, the sun is about half a degree across an arc. Okay, as is the moon, which is why we're going to have this neat eclipse Monday. Um, so you'll have to correct for that. Above, I'm not a professional navigator, but from my experience in astronomy and whatnot, if you're above 45 degrees, you can ignore it. If you're above 30 degrees, it isn't too much. If you are a navigator, anything below 30 degrees, you have to look up a correction in yet another table and apply it to your calculation. I didn't even begin to show the calculations of how you do this because I thought it was beyond the scope of this, this, this lecture. It would have been a great thing to throw out my students back, back in the day, but I didn't. So also when sighting the sun or moon, it's most accurate to bring the lower limb to the horizon. Because if the sun or moon looks to be halfway below the horizon, that's awful hard to judge. Where's the exact center point? You can't tell. But when the lower limb touches the horizon or appears to, uh, you can you can time it or you can measure it much better. And since the uh, angular size of the sun and moon is half a degree, 30 minutes, halfway up to the center from the horizon would be about 15 minutes. If you're really fussy, those things vary too because the Earth's distance from the sun varies a little bit and the moon's distance from the Earth varies a little bit. And there's tables for that too. You look up your date and you know how much to correct for the size. It's never gonna be much more than one, one minute of arc. They don't vary greatly, but it does vary. So that's additional comments. Um, that might just be the end of this thing. Not quite. Here's pictures of my references. Uh, uh, celestial navigation, which I borrowed from the museum's library. The uh, Navigate book and the Longitude book came from a public li library. This is the last textbook I used when I was teaching the shop. And if anybody wants titles and authors, uh, I have those actual books right here. You can look at them and write down what you need. Okay. Uh, that's basically it. Is there any questions? I think I'm, I can't believe it. I'm five minutes short. <laughs> Usually I go half an hour over. <laughs> I really, really trying. Any questions? None? Okay. Uh, thank you.